this afternoon. Uh, I believe that archive is familiar to many of you here, so I will have a very brief introduction. It's more than 20 years old, and it uh, somewhat ushered open access to preprint publications in many disciplines, including physics, math, computer science, astronomy, quantitative biology, statistics, so on and so forth. Just to give you a sense of its use, last year we received 64 million downloads for these papers from all around the world. Four years ago um, at Cornell, we started an initiative, a sustainability initiative, in order to plan um, archives future from many perspectives, from business, finance, governance, usability, technology. Uh, this will be a very, very brief uh, overview, so I will just share with you in a snapshot mode a few principles that we try to either implement or we learned through lessons. But if you are interested in learning more, I would suggest that you go to this page with plenty of information about its background and more detailed uh, aspects of how we implemented this initiative. Uh, one of the starting points for us in sustainability was to clearly define the value proposition of a public good, public good being archive, accessible globally free to researchers. And for that purpose, uh, we actually created a very succinct four-page document to describe Cornell's, uh, um, Cornell's role plus archive's core values. And in addition, we tried to identify some of the core stakeholder groups and integrate within value proposition what their roles are. Uh, this really shows a somewhat, I would say, simplified version of the stakeholders uh, uh, that are present surrounding archives operation. But let me give you one example from financial perspective. Uh, in means of our uh, membership model, we focused on libraries and research laboratories. And the reason was that we felt that libraries and research laboratories had been at the focus of, at the center of scholarship for years and they naturally have a stewardship role. And therefore, for us, it was a very natural role that didn't involve any conflict of interest to form a membership model and to engage these institutions. From a financial perspective, we tried to diversify, and actually we are still working on this, uh, but this is a snapshot of uh, the current financial model. The funds are coming from the Cornell University Library, from a scientific foundation and member institutions. Uh, currently, we have um, 173 members representing 22 countries. And uh, one of the principles that we are trying to learn is to have transparency about the archive operation, including its expenses. Many of us run repositories. We have been in this business for years, but when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to clearly identify what the costs are, wh how they occur, and how they fluctuate, it is still work in progress. After five years of uh, writing, trying to identify annual costs, I must admit that we are still trying to, uh, you know, uh, unbundle expenses or try to kind of more clearly identify where, what are the sources of uh, revenue and what are the sources of expenses for archive. Another principle uh, that we are paying attention is, again, along the lines of transparency, is the organizational model. How we are running archive, uh, different roles, responsibilities. And we also feel that uh, our community is in really desperate need of sharing this sort of information from organization and financial perspective. How much we are spending, what are the skill sets represented, and what are the organizational members to be able to build sustainable models collectively. Uh, I'm the program director, and actually we are in the process of uh, recruiting a scientific director. Uh, we do thoroughly believe that uh, at the heart of repository initiatives should be collaborations between, or I should say, among different stakeholders, either even if the libraries are taking the lead in sustainable planning, involving scientists in this process is critical. And along that line, uh, this is how our governance model looks like. Uh, Cornell University Library has a set of roles, especially managing the moderation of submissions, operating archive, uh, thinking about long-term access from preservation perspective, financial responsibility. And we work very closely with two advisory boards. 
And both of these advisory boards have bylaws so that members of these boards clearly know what their roles are and what their contributions are and how they are involved in the archives day-to-day uh, -day operation. Again, I want to emphasize that archive success stems from it's coming from the scientific community. And after 20 years, we are still trying to give prominence to the scientists' roles, their needs, and their uh, sociocultural issues. Therefore, a very important part of our governance model is, uh, uh, is the scientific advisory board and their involvement in sometimes even day-to-day -day operation. We also have a member advisory board that represents libraries and repository communities because we think equally important as intellectual oversight of archive is engaging the global repository community in running the repository, including interoperability, standards, development priorities, so on and so forth. Uh, as I said, given the short duration of this presentation, I'm just giving you kind of sampling snapshots, but uh, some of the principles that I have um, included so far, I mentioned number one, importance of academic community, uh, number two, which is clearly defined mandates and governance, uh, uh, governance structure. And the fifth one, which is reliance on business planning strategies. Even open access initiatives require business plans because we need revenues, we have expenses. So we really need to understand that especially nonprofit operations need a clearly identified and transparently communicated business plans. Uh, again, going with my snapshot approach, I would like to give you two examples to illustrate number three, which is technology related, and number four, which is about content policies. And I'll start with the importance of content policies. Um, uh, I would say one of the success principles of archive is quality control, which may not be a very uh, kind of an obvious uh, process for you, but in a very simple sense, we are receiving 230 to 250 articles every day at Cornell. And our staff is, is uh, doing a very cursory review of each paper received, just to make sure that these are actually scientific papers. They have been submitted by legitimate authors, that they are coming from a certain institution, and that to identify different subject categories using automated tools. But a very critical pro uh, element of this process is we have engaged close to 140 scientists from all over the world. And each paper submitted, even if it's just one minute glance, is looked over as scientist to make sure that we are maintaining the quality parameters. As I said, this is not necessarily maybe a very well-known aspect of archive, but I want to emphasize that uh, maintaining an open access repository doesn't mean that we should accept everything that for the stability and the quality of the scholarly enterprise, I think it's very important that we all, based on our own content policies, define, even at a very lower level, some quality parameters. The other issue that I want to mention to you is, again, as a success principle for archive, we gather minimal metadata because we want to make this um, deposit process very fast, very robust. Therefore, we have to sacrifice we librarians love metadata, right? Especially with the new obligations with uh, funding sources, so on and so forth, the research data. We are so, in a way, uh, uh, you know, we have, we have incentive to add and request more data from authors. But we uh, firmly believe at this point that uh, with uh, authors, as we speak with scientists, it's very important to keep the barrier of uh, ingest, the, the barrier of submission very low. Unless your organization is in a position to invest in uh, submission staff where the staff would be monitoring and um, adding articles to your repository. The other issue I want to mention is um, last five years we are uh, very well aware of the importance of research data and especially we are very much uh, involved in creating an integrated scholarly communication environment where we have preprint uh, published article, postprint, research uh, data, images, so on and so forth, are presented and discovered in an integrated way. Um, with Archive, a couple of years ago, we were involved in a research study with data, data conservancy from Johns Hopkins to experiment with using Archive 
as a front-end interface to accept research data too. Uh, actually, I'll be glad to uh, give you, if you're interested in uh, the URL for a blog article that we published about this experiment, but what I want to uh, share with you is that with research data, the most complex things about small data. After running it for two years, we were just surprised to see that as we are talking about research data, what we are seeing coming from our researchers is many small data sets and sometimes very difficult to identify. Some articles, they might have 20 data sets deposited, but in means of understanding you know, how these data sets relate to each other, how they relate to the article, so on and so forth, that is not very clear. Uh, and I want to offer this as an example of sustainability because as we focus on uh, this cutting edge and innovative feature, sometimes what will define sustainability and usability is attention to uh, kind of daily operational issues such as this one. So these are my very quick um, remarks. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, next we're going to hear about Jurospace. Uh, we have here Michelle Kempton, who is the chief.